you're listening to episode 132 of My Life Radio. I am Matt Blackburn, and today I'm really excited to interview Matt Maruka. He's the founder of a blue light blocking glasses company called Raw Optics and the creator of The Light Diet, which focuses on circadian rhythm timing and how light affects our biology, both externally consumed and internally consumed via food. I really respect Matt Maruka because he's an experimenter like myself, and he's actually embarking on an experiment now that is contrary to what he's been taught as far as nutrition goes. And I think that's really cool because that's how we figure out what works and what doesn't. But there is that foundation of your relationship with light. I remember being four or five years into studying alternative health or natural healing and starting to pick up books about sunlight and photons and how they affect our biology. And my experience with being outside, exposing my skin and my eyes to sunlight was a completely different experience with having more knowledge of how it affects our cells. And maybe it was psychosomatic, but I felt like I sunburned less with that increased awareness of what it's doing to my body. And back then I had vastly different views than I do today regarding nutrition and what we should use to protect ourselves from UV induced damage, for example, which I'll go into later in the show. But for now, we're just going to jump in. Matt was one of the first guys talking about deuterium or heavy hydrogen several years ago. And he actually has sat down with Dr. Laszlo Boros, one of the world's leading scientists talking about deuterium. So Matt has some really interesting perspectives to share about this topic. And I would say grounded is a good way to put it because people can take this a little too far, uh, same as with light and just become a little too dogmatic and kind of lose the forest for the trees. He then breaks down mitochondrial function, how we generate energy and why the traditional view of how our body works is not accurate. And we have a few Q&A questions as well. So without further ado, here is Matt Maruka. All right, Matt Maruka, welcome to the show. Hello, how you doing? <laughs> I'm really excited for this one. Uh, our, our paths have crossed a few times over the years, and I think uh, we're kindred spirits in the uh, experimentation realm of learning by experience and kind of uh, being contrarians to some degree and, and experimenting with different things um, opposite of what we think we know. And so that's what I really appreciate about you. And I think you, you're sharing a lot of really <laughs> fascinating info and a lot of practical info to help people improve their health. So thanks. Thank you. Well, I appreciate I appreciate you saying that, man. I feel the same way about you. It's, it's cool just so people have the background, like to know that, you know, at one point, like, I was this huge fan of Jack Cruz. And I mean, you could probably tell the story from your perspective, but like Jack was really, really busting your chops and giving you a hard time about everything basically. And so naturally as someone who was like looking up to him a little bit blinded at the time, I was just like the same way thinking like, Oh, I don't, I don't know if I should talk to Matt or associate or, you know, he's thinking about all these different crazy things. And, and then when we re met at the, at Ben, Ben Greenfield's place, not long ago, it was like, Hey, how you doing, bro? Like all that, bullshit aside like we're, we basically have the same uh goal and and method you know so why not just like try it and sure there's going to be things that i think are a good idea that you think are a horrible idea and you think i'm are a good idea that i think are a horrible horrible idea but whatever it's super fun so i'm with you <laughs> <laughs> i love it yeah and what it really comes down to to me is helping people like truly helping people and i think there are a lot of like vampires in this industry um especially mainstream natural health like I like to go a little deeper to like alternative, alternative health, I like to call it. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, you can, once you're in this for long enough, like I've been in this 11 years, you can kind of tell who 
who is just focusing on marketing and who has actual information and is interested in experimenting on themselves and finding out what truly works and really finding the truth. Um, and that's what I believe that you're doing. So I'm doing my best. <laughs> that's what I want to do. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we were, we were chatting about deuterium before we hit recording and, uh, yeah, you said you have a lot of thoughts. I've been diving into that. I, I haven't shared it yet publicly, but the last two weeks I've been down the rabbit hole. You know, a couple of years late, this kind of hit, I think two to three years ago in the health community and uh, exploded. Divine timing. And, yeah. <laughs> I just kind of, whenever anything comes up that's new, I kind of step back for a minute and say like, okay, I'm going to take a while to look at this before I you know, experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's super smart. The thoughts I was referring to that I think are relevant is that like basically I feel lucky in a certain respect because I learned about this whole deuterium thing on the earlier end because of Jack Cruz because he's usually on the cutting edge of something um, and including that one. Now it's Bitcoin and he's going pretty hard on that and I think he's I think he's on point with it to be honest. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, all the science behind it, I'm not so familiar with the because he's, he's putting these cool parallels. But anyway, so back to deuterium. He was talking about it and he was sharing the research of this guy, Laszlo Boros, with a broader, you know, with his audience, um, of which I was a part for the most part at the time. And basically, still am to a degree. And Laszlo Boros is this basically doctor of metabolic health and so on at UCLA. And he's been researching, he's like in their biology department and he's been researching life for a, a long time. And he, he tells a really interesting story that you may be here on these podcasts where basically this guy from uh, his home country, Hungary, basically wanted to bring over this idea that they had been discovering over in Europe about deuterium depleted water, which is based on this Russian research that basically showed that there were these, um, I mean, they argue, the Hungarians, the Romanians, and the Russians argue about who discovered the relevance of deuterium first. But the Russians I've spoken with, who are Robert Slovak and his people, um, are the Russian descended, you know, people talking about deuterium. They argue the Russians found it, and it was these studies of Siberians that basically were significantly more super centenarians than anywhere else in Russia, right? And they looked at everything they could, they couldn't figure it out. But then they started looking at their water and saw that like, you know, they measured deuterium in the water and saw that the deuterium in their water was significantly lower. So they started to conclude like, whoa, low deuterium could be causing these people to have significantly extended lifespans. And I believe this is true. I, I really believe that they're onto something with that, just myself based on my own intuition and kind of reading about it. At the same time, there's things that they cannot reconcile with all their theories about deuterium, like that Boros cannot explain and cannot reconcile. And I asked him about some of them on the podcast. Like, for example, how do people in certain places where they eat lots of carbohydrates and have for hundreds or thousands of years still live to really long, healthy lifespans? Like, and this is something the keto people can't really reconcile either. Like, you look at someone where I just was uh, living for the last six months in the N Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, which is a blue zone. And I was going to say right here, but then I realized, oh, I'm in San Diego. Now I'm not there anymore. Dang it. I just was on planes all day yesterday. So um, so basically with the Nicoya Peninsula, like they eat tons of carbohydrates. Rice and beans is like the base of their diet and mangoes and fruits. And they eat some chicken and meat too. But it's like Dr. Boros's only explanation was that they have – and I think this is a very, very lacking explanation, which just shows that there's a lack of understanding about deuterium mechanics throughout the, throughout the entire system – which is what I'm getting at. But basically he was saying that it's through their stool that they eliminate more deuterium and that that's how they're able to, that they have this ability to eliminate more deuterium through their stool, which I just find to be an insufficient explanation, even though I'm not the PhD researcher here, um, just to disclaim that, just to be clear. But then you have Jack Cruz, who I do think has a more holistic perspective, which he always would basically say that if you're in the sun and your mitochondria are working optimally, the mitochondria burn, you know, when we're not eating fuel, when we're in a fasted state, the mitochondria are burning our own fat to make water, which is 100% or almost 100% deuterium free. So I thought about that and I'm like, well, wait. If our body can make and basically live off its own energy stores and make deuterium free water so we have less deuterium in the cell, then that would be that would be so far superior 
to any ketogenic diet, which keeps you in the 100 parts per million range, that it's not even a comparison. Like it's literally relevant. And I think about a friend of mine who's actually is a raw vegan, who's an Ayurvedic doctor and Indian yogi. Like he's like a basically like a monk. And he's one of the healthiest people I've ever met. Like physically, you know, you can see it. You can see it on his labs. You can see it in his spiritual energy. And I'm like, how is this guy a raw vegan and doing all this well? And, and so what, the point is it all led me to think that, yes, maybe – the reason ketogenic diets work so well is because they do reduce deuterium and that can be true because they're cutting out all the excess refined carbohydrate shit that people are eating. I mean, and maybe you have a different perspective on that. And I'd love to also hear that, but, but so yes, that can be true. And it can be true that you can eat carbohydrates if you're in a really healthy environment or your internal systems work so well, whether it's spiritually, physically, mentally, et cetera, they're all linked that you can basically kick out, uh, as I'm thinking, kick out, the deuterium that you are taking in and ultimately if you're eating a healthy diet whether it's plant-based or uh animal-based it's still going to be lower in deuterium than any refined diet so anyway that's my thought the the point is that there's a lot more complexity to it that i think these really isolated researchers aren't looking at like they're talking about the water the deuterium depleted water that people are drinking that's super expensive and it's like you know the water they can get it as low as 25 ppm maybe even lower in some cases but it's really really um, it, it's, a, it's energy. It's a big use of energy. There's all this stuff. I mean, not that, that I'm not super concerned about that personally, um, different discussion, but it's like, there's, they don't have clear, there, there's not a lot of clarity in the deuterium world as I'm getting as a, is what I'm getting at. Like, okay, the water people drink it, they're tumor shrink. So clearly it's doing something, but it's, you know, they they don't fully understand how it works. They've admitted to me, like, we don't really know how the water works hundred percent. Like it's just putting less deuterium in. So anyway, take it. You, this is my thoughts. Take it with a grain of salt. Realize that it's definitely relevant, but that there's probably a lot more affecting how the body utilizes deuterium than just eating a ketogenic diet and drinking the water, which is what their recommendations always are, is go fully keto and drink the water and don't do anything else. I think it'd be better if you didn't drink the water and didn't go keto and lived a healthy lifestyle f- as far as deuterium is concerned. So that's my thought <laughs> that people should know, <laughs> I think. I'm curious what you think about this, you know, having researched it so far. That was amazing. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I I dove in head first, just like I always do to these subjects. And because I've heard it from Jack and you over the years, I kind of had it in the back of my head. And so I think the dots connected faster because of that. Not to say I understand it completely now, but um, for for someone that's never heard of deuterium, which is probably 99% of the people listening to my show, um, It's heavy hydrogen. Maybe you could explain it better, but there's like three major isotopes of hydrogen or flavors. There's like protium, uh, deuterium, and then tritium. And tritium is super rare. And then for every, what is it? Uh, So many drops of- 6,600, I think. Um, I believe it's, yeah. There's one deuterium to every 6,600 proteums. Okay. And so, so like, the idea it's, in other words, it's like one in it's either one in ten thousand or one in a hundred thousand. You'd have to just do the division from sixty six hundred, but yeah. Okay. And then one thing that took me about a week to get is like, okay, why is it higher now? And um I was listening to a lecture by Robert Slovak and he was saying that uh after the ice age things changed, or uh maybe a meteor brought more deuterium, and there's still a question as to what raised the deuterium on the planet, like nuclear bombs going off potentially yeah that's an interesting point to bring up and again that's another place where like just like with i don't know your thoughts about the whole climate uh thing going on i'm i'm sure i could guess what they are reasonably well like in the same way that people are like oh my gosh the world's ending like it's getting warmer i should probably shouldn't talk about this publicly but like (laughs) it's like or we're just in a natural warming cycle which is what the evidence has been implying for a really long time like it's ridiculous but anyway so with deuterium, I think they're just getting hyper focused on like these things that don't really matter. Maybe it's rising, but like there's still so- tons of healthy people out there who keep their deuterium levels low. Like I think about my yogi friend like all the time. You know, he's killing it. The environment isn't affecting him. You know, he's stronger than that. So is Joe Dispenza, and he's always teaching we're stronger than our environment. Like I, I really believe that. But yeah, I- I'll try to explain it the simplest I can. Deuterium, you said it right. I mean, it's it's. Uh, heavy hydrogen so basically hydrogen is the simplest form of matter and matter based on what we know about everything in the universe with the 
development of quantum physics by Einstein is that matter is just the slowest fre frequency of light energy. So basically like energy goes from like pure vibration, which is even precedes light. And then it goes down, down, down till light. And then it basically like before there was light in the, in the big bang theory, as they do the mathematical molecules, there was vibration, some kind of vibrational energy and sound. And so in the biblical, uh, you know, scriptures and all these ancient scriptures, it's like, it always sound is what they use to explain the vibration, even though it wasn't sound because sound as we know implies matter, but it was a type of vibration that they're using sound to, to explain and sound always predates like light. So like first God spoke and then there was light. Um, but God spoke first. And so there was that vibrational energy first. So anyway, energy, just as a high level of energy and matter for people. So matter, which is hy hydrogen is the simplest form of matter. It basically is, this is fascinating. Oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps trying to explain this because this is all about the light diet basically, which is my sort of thing right now. So basically as energy goes from vibration down to light, down to matter, it's just slowing down. That's all. So matter is just slow down energy that we can actually perceive with our senses in a certain way because our senses are limited. At least our 3D senses are limited to the physical world. Our pineal gland is able to sense vibration and greater frequencies than what we can sense with our physical senses. But that's what we're limited to. So basically what's really interesting, if you think about hydrogen as the lightest and, and smallest of all matter, it is the closest form of matter between light energy and physical matter. And so basically that's what hydrogen is. And that's why it, if you if you go back even one step in matter before an actual atom, like from with hydrogen or in protons and neutrons and electrons, if you just have electrons, electrons are even more in that in that in between range between matter and energy. It's they're not you know it's kind of matter, but it's also doesn't really have any mass or it has minimal mass. So electrons are even closer to just pure light, and then you have light, which is just. And they're always trying to figure out, is it a particle or is it a wave? Well, it has properties of both. And then if you go way back, then it's just it's just waves. Then it's just vibration. So that's the step down. So anyhow, life uses hydrogen in a similar way that any electrical system uses electricity. We use hydrogen to make basically protonicity, which is a flow of energy and electricity, a charge, using hydrogen. And that's how our mitochondria work is basically they pump hydrogen across a gradient using sunlight energy from food pump the hydrogen keep them in a tight high there's a high charge differential but there's a high charge potential energy potential there and so then we and that's what we use to we force them across a membrane and then pack them in a space and then that makes it so that we can channel them intentionally down through the atpase to make it spin make atp to unfold proteins and power biochemical reactions and so that flow of protons through the ATPase is basically like protonicity. It's like basically tunneling of protons. So if just for example, for people thinking about this, and this is probably a pretty scientific audience, you can think of that flow of protons almost like a flow of electricity because it's so close to just pure energy compared to like what we typically think of matter, like a table or something. Now, so when you, so life the whole point is life runs on hydrogen. We're hydrogen-based beings, hydrogen and oxygen. But but many there are many like living organisms that are bacteria that don't use oxygen as a primary electron acceptor. The ones that do are the ones that became the most complex life on Earth because it's a really powerful electron acceptor. That's the animals, plants, fungi. We work with mitochondria, and so we became super complex because mitochondria use oxygen, and it's really advantageous for a lot of reasons. But anyhow, so if you think that life at its best is running just on pure hydrogen, like the lightest form of energy we could possibly run off is like basically just pure hydrogen or even just pure light, um, even better than just hydrogen. Now, because deuterium is double the weight of hydrogen, so it looks like hydrogen. So molecular, like, like biochemically and, and atomically and chemically, it reacts with other molecules and atoms the same way that hydrogen does because of its the number of electrons it has. It has one proton and one electron. But the difference with dude, so it's kind of like a, it's kind of like the, the the twin brother, but like there's like a good twin brother and then like the evil twin brother who's able to sneak in because he's the identical twin, but then do all this evil. So he sneaks in and is like, hey, I'm hydrogen. But he's like, I'm actually deuterium though. I'm not protium. And so once um, 
deuterium binds to anything. Like so with hydrogen based life, which is what we are, all of these chemical reactions are constantly unfolding that are occurring where things bind and unbind and bind and unbind. This is how biochemical reactions and processes occur. So when deuterium, when anything with deuterium binds, it's seven times as much energy to unbind that deuterium. So it basically clogs up metabolic cycles and metabolic pathways if it gets into the wrong places. That's what Boros and these people talk about. So basically to, to tie this in a bow, when any deuterium gets into the system, it's basically like having jet fuel or like jet fuel full of marbles. Like it literally will break the system. It's that different from pure hydrogen. And so we, there is definitely a need to, you know, keep deuterium at a low. But the reason I talk about the light diet here is because the whole focus of what I'm talking about with light, I only saw this coming together the last like not too long with deuterium, but deuterium, like regular hydrogen is lighter than heavy hydrogen. And so the light diet, part of what it's doing, it's actually improving our body's entire ability to be more light, like literally more light, less matter. And so it's the, the way I think about it is this deuterium versus hydrogen thing is just a very like biochemical reductionist way to look at like basically health versus disease, like a super fundamental process to all life. But it's amazing that they're elucidating it because nobody knew about this stuff before. And it explains how ketogenic diets work, why they work so well. But it also explains why for a lot of people, they don't work well, because if your mitochondria suck and your environment sucks, then it doesn't matter if you eat keto. I did that for the longest time and I still felt like shit. And people are like, well, you weren't doing it right. It's like, well, I tried every single variation of paleo, autoimmune paleo, carnivore, keto, like didn't really work, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's that's like why I think this is important, and I think people should understand that. And I hope that paints a good picture for why we want less deuterium. That was an awesome explanation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I like that you said reductionist way of looking at it because I think it we is. all get <laughs> hot in that. Like you probably see me over the years talking about like salt based NPK fertilizers. You know, especially people drinking vegetable juice. And I, my thing is like, you know, what water do they use? With that celery juice, it was tap water, bio sludge water, or, you know, toxic water. Um, and uh, is our rain different? Yes, it is. We have acid rain. So I've been like harking on this for years, but the acid rain being more acidic liberates excess iron and alumina from the soil. And this is like high school presentation stuff. Like the EPA has articles on it and like it's a reality. And you could hyper focus on these two things, NPK and acid rain, like I did for years, and just narrow down what you're eating to where you're just so militant and you're stressed out about being militant <laughs> because it's just unnatural and unsustainable. And I see that the same way with deuterium, where all these podcasts and interviews I'm listening to, it's, you know, oh, gluten's full of deuterium, sugar's full of deuterium. You know, it's just like cutting tons of things out where life's really about enjoyment, right? I mean, a big part of it, enjoying time with your loved ones and enjoying your food and thanking it, you know, and feeling blessed for having food to eat and stuff. And there's so much more to health as you kind of uh, elucidated yeah. to. And um, yeah, I just think that's a good point. There, there, there's a big picture here. And I, Morley Robbins that I've had on my show multiple times, he texted me something really interesting because I was like, yeah, I'm getting into deuterium. And he said, uh, Deuterium activates AMPK, the ancient conserved fat sensor. Um, he said, cop and he sent me a study. He said, copper is the more natural catalyst, given that most downstream functions that AMPK orchestrates require bioavailable copper. Um, so his whole thing is, you know, copper balances iron overload and um, iron toxic mitochondria make more deuterium. And so that's something we didn't really talk about too much. Sense. But like our cells make metabolic water and it's they're supposed to make deuterium depleted water right yeah to. well it's basically deuterium free or it's very yeah very low water uh sorry very low deuterium water because the metabolic this is what boros talks about is that the metabolic pathways that if you eat a, a carbohydrate like a gram of sugar or anything or fat whatever it he explained to me, and this was in person, at, I got to meet him at one event, which was really cool. It was He's very passionate, which I love because he, he knows – that's the best part is when someone thinks they know something that's important, whether it's true or not, they're passionate about it. And he's actually on to something that is really relevant. This is relevant. Just the details of how do we apply it and blah, blah, blah. That's all like the, the, the jibber jabber, but like he is on to something important. And so he said that you know, to get the sugar from 
you know, A to B or A to Z to get a sugar so that you can put the electrons into the electron transport chain. He, he, he said he's had biochemical students ask him like it because that's he teaches biochemistry at UCLA. That's what I'm realizing now. Like, why can't you? Um, why can't you just do it in two or three steps? Because there's they're like, well, you could do this, this and this and then you have the same outcome. And he basically said that the entire Krebs cycle, all of the like 10 or 12 steps that it takes is all metabolic checks to get rid of deuterium in his perspective, whether that's the whole reason why there's all those steps. It's probably again reductionist, but it's really fascinating to think like, oh, so yeah, um, I, I'm totally. So the point is, when we when we eat anything, yes, the water our mitochondria makes it should be 100% deuterium free because the only hydrogen that because when we make water, it's the hydrogen that was inside the mitochondrial matrix that's being pumped back across the uh, intermembrane. Um, the inner electron transport chain is called the inner mitochondrial membrane. And then it's in that intermembrane space. And then it's being allowed to tunnel back through the ATPase into the matrix again. And so that hydrogen that gets there into the matrix in the first place, which is coming from the Krebs cycle, which is coming from fats or from carbohydrates we're eating, it shouldn't have any deuterium in it once it gets into the matrix. And if it does, this is the key thing. If it does, then according to their research, all it takes is one deuterium atom to break a whole mitochondria, to break it, not a whole mitochondria, to, to break an ATPase. And so it's a really, really interesting uh, theory. So yes, any water a mitochondria makes by definition has to be completely deuterium free because it can't, the mitochondria can't use deuterium to generate energy, and therefore it can't ever make it to the point where it binds with oxygen and makes deuterium water. It's probably possible, but if if they're right that one single deuterium breaks the ATPase, then it's not possible. It's completely impossible. So you're right. Our body makes metabolic water. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, free a deuterium. that's a great explanation. Yeah, and um, I listened to Ben Greenfield's podcast where he interviewed the – Center for Deuterium Depletion in LA, and they're they kind of people, yeah. Okay, yeah, and they, they kind of dis- got it. Okay, yeah, and they kind of disagree with the, um, you know, Slovak deuterium test thing because they were saying you don't just get your saliva deuterium tested because that's just one part of the puzzle. They said you need to also see how well you're depleting it too, which is like the flip side of the coin. Do you mm. kind of agree with that as far as I, testing? I haven't. Or- I haven't looked enough into the testing. I did a test a while back and I was, I was still deep in my health, you know, journey. I still am, but like I've overcome so much that I had not overcome then. I'll just put it that way. And that was like three years ago. And I got this test and my deuterium levels were really high. And so it makes sense. Like, but I was, I shouldn't be shocked because I was struggling mentally, physically different ways. Um, so I don't know if the tests are accurate, but I would assume if they can like I would want to do the test on myself like 10 days in a row or like a month every day or like every other, you know, just a couple times consistently for a period of time and see like, is this accurate? Like, is it fluctuating just within one individual and then test it between individuals and, and just, they need to just do more of it, I think. But if it is accurate to a certain extent, then it's cool that they can see that some people's deuterium levels are like 130 and some people's deuterium levels are like 100. I think if if the test is truly accurate to what the amount is in the body and then in in that area of the body, the saliva or the breath that they're testing. And then if those numbers are reflective of some deeper level of deuterium in the body that is relevant, then the test could be relevant. But no one is able to answer either of those questions fully. Like, are the tests fully accurate? And are the things they're measuring fully relevant to something deeper in the body? So uh, to your question, I'm not fully convinced by the testing. I did want to say um, an interesting thing about something you said you mentioned earlier that I don't want to skip over before I forget is that uh, Morley Robbins was saying that deuterium signals certain AMPK pathways and things. So it's interesting. Something Jack Cruz was talking about, which I find really interesting and relevant, is that deuterium is necessary for growth in certain respects that I don't fully understand. But like, so Boros had some really fascinating parallels that he drew about deuterium when we were spending time together and talking. He spoke about how, for example, the reason flies eat shit, let's just put it simply, is that 
flies are lower on the evolutionary food chain. They're like the bottom of the evolutionary food chain. They eat shit. And so they live really short lifespans with rapid proliferation. And that's what deuterium is good for because it doesn't allow you to live a long lifespan, but it allows rapid growth and proliferation. And so poop has deuterium. So flies are basically able to live off like, like that's part of the reason I think humans excrete it because it's the leftover stuff we don't want. So flies are able to like, Basically, they found a niche evolutionary, evolutionarily of like the lowest quality, like the lowest quality nutrition that of any organism. But like for them, it's some there's still something they can take advantage of. And God bless any any being that is in a fly in this lifetime. I mean, it's got to be a tough one, you know, to have to eat eat shit. But um, anyhow, that's a side note. So I shouldn't be saying this stuff. But um, so at the same time, he was saying some interesting stuff like the reason glue actually Q Collins, who's part of the Center of Disease Control, uh, sorry, de- deuterium depletion or whatever. And he was on Luke Story's podcast, him and and Anne, I believe her name is the two people. Luke Story interviewed Boris alone, and then he interviewed Q Collins and Dr. I think her name's Dr. Anne. She's the partner at the Center for Deuterium Depletion. And he said, like, the reason gluten is so harmful for people or the the reason people's bodies react so much to gluten isn't because it's gluten. It's because it's really high in deuterium, which was an interesting spin of things, especially GMO gluten. Apparently, when they modify it, when it's modified, it's made to have more, um, you know, it's gluten so that it can be more defensive or whatever. And then therefore somehow has more deuterium because it's the deuterium is allowing the, the, the wheat and other plants to grow more quickly so they can get greater yields of the wheat. But, um, so in other words, the genetic modification itself is causing the wheat to be higher in deuterium so it can grow bigger and faster. Um, but it's not necessarily greater in nutrition. Same thing probably between dry farmed wine versus Monsanto glyphosate GMO wine like the one takes rainwater it has its roots go more than 30 feet down into the the, the the soil so it's like a more pure it's only rainwater which is lower in deuterium so that wine is lower in deuterium it's more pure divine sort of development that takes more time and energy and water and then you have this like pumping irrigated higher deuterium river water or whatever else that water is coming from lake water into you know Napa Valley to irrigate these plants that are super superficial. The, the roots don't go down deep. They don't get, get a lot of the nutrients and they're spraying them with all kinds of chemicals. Like the difference in the quality of two wines alone could be crazy. And then another thing he mentioned is um, if you think about uh, like grass fed animals versus grain fed animals, like there's a reason a grain fed animal is less healthy than a grass fed animal, at least in theory, is because the grain fed animals are loading up on deuterium. So their fat is higher in deuterium. A grass fed animal shirt's sure, going to have less fat, but it's lower in deuterium. It's more like the wine, dry farmed wine versus the natural wine. And there was one other really interesting example. These, these are the things that like run in my head. I'm trying to like constantly like figure out how to the piece of it together. He argues that like, so wolves are like an evolutionary, um, you know, apex predator or not apex but they're a top predator and i believe we're the apex predator humans are the only one if i'm not mistaken but basically wolves are still a top predator and he says the reason that they're able to run so fast and be the the top predator is because they eat the lowest deuterium diet like the reason that a wolf can like be such a high performer and like chase down other animals and outperform them is because it's eating the top highest of the food chain, which is a carnivore diet. Now, I'm just going to put my thesis out here right now um, with you because I think your audience is open to all sorts of stuff. But at present, my theory or hypothesis, I should call it, is that because the carnivore people right now are all using this as fodder to like, ooh, meat's the best food, like because it's lowest in deuterium. Well, that's true. It's the best of the physical food maybe if it's lower in deuterium, but if you could get to a place where you could eat less food overall, like less food overall, because even though it's the lowest in deuterium, if you eat a lot of food, it's still about a hundred plus parts per million. If you're eating saturated fat, it's like the lowest, it's like 105 PPM. It's still better than carbohydrates in certain respects. But if you could eat less food and live in carbohydrates in, in my, in this theory, in this hypothesis and theory, you could like less overall food, but more on carbohydrates, maybe you could balance that out if you're just eating less carbohydrates overall. And then the, the only thing that could replace all of this is light. This is why I'm so I'm getting more and more obsessed with my own creation of the light diet as I learn more about all these things, because it's like ultimately 
I guess what I'm trying to say is the same logic that makes the carnivore diet the best diet, or not the logic, but the science, the same deep biochemical science that makes the carnivore diet the best diet makes the light diet an even better diet. And like, as I talk about the light diet, it's it's the lightest diet we can possibly eat is what I'm starting to really evolve it into. And, and I don't talk about the food side of it frequently because I don't want to offend anyone who has these beliefs. So I'm going to usually keep – I wouldn't talk about this on most podcasts, but yours is the best. So basically, what, I have a friend who's like a, a raw vegan and is like this Ayurvedic doctor. Now, I'm not saying this is the best food diet, the best thing we can do, but I'm starting to think that if we are most fully living on pure spiritual light, that the best thing we could do if we're going to eat any food at all would be to basically eat as little as possible, as light as possible. Like that's just becoming my theory because again, the whole metabolic process of burning food and basically dealing with matter in your body is kind of what not causes aging, but it it causes aging. It's all the reactive oxygen species, the smoke, the metabolic um, byproducts that are produced as a result of having to take energy from food it's like what if you could just go straight to the source just take energy straight from the sun from light and not have to take it through an intermediary where you have to deal with all the stuff the physical matter in between so that's my theory about deuterium at this point i think you get the idea <laughs> that's awesome i uh i love that that theory i was i was living that for a while i think it was <laughs> Four years ago, I was one hour eating window and I was so militant. I'd set the timer in my phone and I would not cheat I'd say, OK, I have, you know, 60 minutes and that's it. And then I just do black coffee and I was doing soy and beans and, um, you know, kind of a, a, a vegan diet, but with probably loaded with deuterium and, and zero sugar, <laughs> except for except for my dinner. And I wasn't feeling too good. I kind of crashed. And so that kind of led me. Uh, to where I am today. And yeah, I'm not sure yeah, about the, that strategy, you know, the coffee, <laughs> the eating within 60 minutes, that, that sounds like it could be a burnout. Um, and I, I mean, you, you were probably getting a lot of sun. You've always been a, a, a sun guy, but so. Right. Yeah. I was doing the sun gazing and the meditation. And um, I think there's something to like, I've been researching um, whole food vitamin C um, like in fruit. And um, I know you're a big fan of like local seasonal fruit. And a lot of people don't know, like ascorbic acid is just the shell of the vitamin C molecule. It actually has like rutin and um, the tyrosinase enzyme. Um, the tyrosinase enzyme contains copper atoms. And um, that copper actually regulates redox metals in our body, like, like iron and copper. And we know, you know, iron's the waiter that carries oxygen around the body, but copper's the chef that cuts up the oxygen. Um, and they're on a seesaw. So if someone's, you know, has a ton of iron from the, the drinking water or the iron fortified foods <clears throat> or the celery juice or whatever it may be, then they're copper deficient. And then that kind of leads to a whole breakdown in the utilization of oxygen. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it's just been something. It makes I've been a lot of, of sense. Thinking. It's a really interesting. You know what? I'm going to pull up the periodic table of the elements right now because I'm really interested. I'm just totally spitballing here, but like I'm almost certain copper is a significantly lighter element than uh, iron. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have any he heavy elements in our body, but I could totally see from again just trying to throw my own thinking onto this, like because I haven't done a ton of research into the uh, effects of too much iron, although I'm aware that it's a big issue. That is um, that is common today, and and actually, it's funny that bloodletting was so effective at, at treating disease because it is that right because it reduced iron, like yeah. And I was promoting donating blood often. I mean, it's if someone has weak adrenals and they've been stressed oh, yeah, a lot, not, yeah, then they'll get faint. But you know, sweating in a sauna, you can actually get rid of irons not as much, but some through sweating. Um, and there there are various ways to deplete it, even milk actually. Like we have goats mm. here and I drink a lot of raw goat milk and milk has lactoferrin and other things, which I love dairy. Help. Like I love dairy, dude. I'm like my, like you see my hair. I'm like a Nordic, like my ancestors probably like only drank milk and ate cheese and stuff like for like generations. Like they're probably like dairy goat farmers, you know, and maybe they'd fish and they have like Vikings or something. But anyway, totally with you. That's fascinating.
Yeah, like Adam Bergstrom, a, a, a frequent guest on my show. Yeah, I've, I've heard. I've had. You know, it's funny. I'm sorry to interrupt, man. I've had a friend from Europe who told me about Adam Bergstrom like two or three years ago, and I was like, "No way! This guy is like, you know," because I was like buying in all these different theories, and now I'm starting to look at all this stuff. And I, I saw that you had interviewed him. I'm like, you know, like definitely I'm not discrediting anything he's saying anymore. Like, I don't know if it's true because I haven't done enough digging and all the research of his and the, the details of it, but like, it's pretty cool. It's, it's, I just want to correct myself. Copper is heavier than iron. So it, it, there's, there's not no correlation there to lighter elements in the body, but, but clearly they have totally different functions. So yeah. 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 And it's required for cytochrome C oxidase and all like, I think it's 24 respiratory enzymes that are copper dependent. And so it definitely is the chef, but, but yeah, Adam's awesome. And he's like a contrarian and his kind of worldview is yes, no, maybe. So he has a quantum kind of perspective on life that there's always that maybe possibility. And so he often quotes like, you know, Guinness world record stuff, like the guy that ate a whole Cessna plane, you know, like, like impossible things <laughs> that people have done, uh, just kind of making the point, like, you know, it's not so black and white in health which I appreciate that perspective because I think people can get very focused and stress themselves out, you know, like we're talking about in the context of deuterium and it's like, you know, no sugar ever, no, no pasta ever. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, totally a little extreme. So yeah. But um, yeah. So moving on from deuterium, we have quite a lot to talk about. Um, <laughs> I mean, we were going to talk about mitochondria, which I guess, we kind of did it a little bit. I know you've delved into this a, a little deeper than I have. I've read a few books like, um, uh, what is it? The Nick Lane book, uh, mm -hmm. set, was it sex power? And... Yeah. Sex power, suicide. He has the vital <laughs> yeah. question and he has another one called oxygen. And I actually haven't read oxygen and sex power and suicide. I totally need to. And they've been on like high on my list for too long that I haven't read them. Um, but, but the vital questions are really, really good one about, the whole origin of life. Mm -hmm. And is that counter to Gilbert Ling's work? Because it's my understanding that Gilbert Ling question, like the sodium potassium pump hypothesis saying there's not yeah. enough energy to do it. And he's questioning the, membranes. And <laughs> there are, um, there definitely are conflicts. And I actually met Nick Lane in London like a couple of years ago. Cause I was just like young and traveling. I was like, let me meet all these researchers and maybe they'll have the answers. They don't, I can say that for sure. Um, but I thought maybe they would. Um, so they have some answers about very specific things, you know, within a very limited realm of, of understanding, I would say. But when I question, when I mentioned Gilbert Ling's work, he was like, it was like, it was like, I had like, you know, I don't know, like you know, something really uh, pro profane and, and, and messed up that I had said, and it was some, something very simple, but, um, <laughs> so, you know, he got very defensive is the point. So yes, it's, it, it is kind of counter contrary and that's something I have to do a lot more reading. You know, it's, it's like Gilbert Ling's work to properly read and, and do, which I've only again, skimmed, I would say skimmed the surface of what he's actually published is like, it's like an undertaking. Like you could spend a whole year doing nothing but reading Gilbert Ling's work, like factually, like and doing a good job at it. Um, so I'm not quite, yeah. I don't quite have all the time for that with my business right now, but <laughs> I'd love to eventually. Yeah, I think Dr. Ray Pete and Dr. Cowan, Thomas Cowan, they both have studied Gilbert's work and supposedly read most of it or all of it. And um, it's helpful two, to have two these really people smart people yeah. still information. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I don't know enough about Dr. Ray Pete's work. And I, I actually, Cowan is very fascinating as well with his, his being one of the uh, popular at, you know, speakers against COVID. But um, mm -hmm. so we're talking uh, sex power suicide. <laughs> yeah so um yeah i guess i mean my my show is called mito life and i haven't really had an episode yet all on mitochondria i probably should and i've listened to you um numerous times talk about the history of mitochondria how they came about um you know if evolution is true which <laughs> you know that's a that's an assumption which um you know, a lot of people question. I actually had a raw vegan on the show that debates uh, evolutionary people on YouTube. And he's a, he's a young earth creationist, but he's so intelligent and um, 
the way, I mean, he doesn't debate with the Bible. He debates like with science. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of in the realm of like, who knows? Like there's a lot of things like that where, you know, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Cause like today you couldn't be considered like a, in the scientific mainstream world, you couldn't be considered a legitimate scientist if you don't accept certain theories like evolution. But I do think it's cool that now with the internet and people like us who have conversations like day by day, piece by piece, like the people who just untap the most of the truth, I think ultimately come to light if they want to. Some people choose to stay hidden, like people like Joe Dispenza, like people, you know, and, and almost like I think people come to light to the degree to which they've been able to access some some facet of the truth, uh, you know, just a, a theory. But then there's people who at the same time, as you kind of alluded to with the mainstream health world of like who, who gain a huge Instagram following, but like it's super duper um, fake. They don't look superficial. They don't look the part. They don't feel the part energetically, but like there's all these people who are like desperate in this modern world and they're able to like, I don't want to say pray because I don't think it's intentional, but like prey on the energy of like people who are um, really, really struggling and they're like, ooh, you take my bulletproof coffee and it's going to save your life and you're going to be happy and like you take all these supplements and they're going to make you happy. And it's like, yeah, like, I mean, I sell products too. Like I sell blue light blocking glasses, but like, I think it's important to distinguish that like, you know, I don't, at least I hope I've never done this, but like going around and being like, these glasses will save your life. Like they, they, I do believe that they actually have the ability to make a more significant impact for people's health than just about anything else, which is why I make them. But still, I, I, I'm just saying I'd never want to be like that. So anyhow, going, going to, um, this, this conversation about mitochondria, like, should I, you want me to like kind of just give like high level overview of mitochondria as I well, as I come to know them? Well, I think uh, what where I want to start is uh, like I used to describe it as just high school mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, which is not giving it enough credit. Where we understand now that kind of the bigger role of mitochondria is to make um, well we make CO two, but we also make metabolic water. And there's a process of unfolding proteins, right? That's kind of more important than just being the powerhouse of the cell. Like, yeah, it's, it's a little more complex than we've been taught. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this is, this is a very, very fascinating subject. And um, I just actually pulled up the etymology of mitochondria and chondrios means granule and mito means thread. So it's interesting. I have to think about that. There's a reason that they picked the name because of what they looked like when they first were able to see them under microscopes, of course, when they named them. But yeah, so um, this is stuff that I've mostly learned from Jack Cruz as a translator of the deeper, deeper science that at the time I wasn't fully equipped to understand as like a 17, 18 year old, just reading 16 year old, reading all these books. Um, I read, I, I got a lot of really great information, especially at that time. But uh, these, these, some of these people were hard to access, right, as far as the depth of the science for me, not having a deep biochemistry degree. Now I feel I'd be more equipped to handle that stuff, but even then I'd probably need a lot of, of digging. But so um, this is Gilbert Ling. Like I think one of his main theories is, is this idea that ATP doesn't basically account for even a tenth – even like a hundredth of the energy that cells actually utilize. Like he was doing the calculations and found like, wait a minute, like you would need like this much ATP to power the amount of reactions that are occurring in every single cell, every single second, like the, all the biochemistry requires like a ridiculous amount of energy. I mean, the voltage, Dr. Cruz talks about this again, the voltage on just the mitochondrial membrane is that of like a bolt of lightning. Like there's a lot of voltage there. You know, it's not, it's, it's not like, it's, it's high voltage, so it's power. Um, it's not like current per se, like when you have, you know, there's more electricity moving through wires in certain respects, um, but in, in certain respects, really not actually. Anyhow, so I think there's something very, very much important about what you just brought up, this idea that the mitochondria, they make ATP, and what ATP does is it causes proteins to unfold. And then the proteins can bind to basically this 
superconducting water network within the body that basically carries energy and actually powers everything. And again, this is why I'm I'm interested of I'm playing toying with this with this concept of a light diet because it's like if if it really is about this water like basically fourth phase structured water uh, network that basically makes up most of who we are and the energy that flows through that, like we really only need food for a certain to for building blocks and to unfold things. And if we could just fully tap into light, like as an energy source, then we could be like supercharged and aging more slowly and functioning a lot better. So totally there's something uh, valid to that and, and very, very relevant. Is it, um, cause f- fourth phase water might be new to some of the people that listen to this show. Um, and Dr. Gerald Pollack has talked about that a lot. And there are people trying to, uh, like do that to their water by like putting it in the sun or something. And, um, it's my understanding that you could only create that in your body to our understanding. Right. And it's with is yeah. it red light. Like red light and ultrasound. It's yeah, it's infrared light, and you have to have an infrared light source and a hydrophilic membrane that the water is up against. And so somehow, basically, with a hydrophilic water loving surface, when you get the right wavelengths of infrared light, it causes the water molecules to break apart. So literally, splitting water, H O H and H, and the O H groups basically latch onto this liquid crystalline lattice that is this fourth phase structured water, the chemical formula is H3O2. And then the rest of the water is excluded. They call it like bulk water. It's just like, it's not the structured water. And then, and this is basically what forms, this is what the water in cells is. It's structured. If you think about all the membranes in the body are hydrophilic water loving surfaces. So all the water around them are, is structured. And all of the mitochondria what they're doing is they're producing infrared light. They're releasing infrared light heat. That's what they're doing because they're not fully efficient in their energy production. And so they're also just like a car engine that's not perfectly efficient. They're also releasing infrared light, causing the water, or this is where it gets really interesting. And this is where I think Jack Cruz is genius beyond geniuses because he saw this stuff that very few people are seeing. Like, I just had like a flash of this. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. So I, it's in other words, as we're speaking, I just, just something that he had been saying for so long, I finally really started, I think, understand it a bit. But anyway, I don't want to, I'm talking about Jack a lot. I don't want to give people the idea that I'm, um, that I'm claiming to accurately fully represent his work. I'm sharing my own interpretations, a lot of these different things, just so that's disclaimed. That's separate. You know, what, what another person saying is another, another thing. So basically the mitochondria, don't always release a lot of infrared light. Like people who are equatorial haplotypes of mitochondria, meaning their mitochondria come from closer to the equator of the tropics, they, their mitochondria release a lot less infrared light. Why? Because the sun's there to structure the water all the time. That's it's fascinating. But so the sun, basically when you have the light and the sun in, in ample amounts, you basically don't need the mitochondria to kick off nearly as much in infrared to keep all the water in the cells structured because you have it from the sun. But then if you if you don't have a lot of sun, it's really useful to have loosely coupled mitochondria in certain respects as well. Um, so anyhow, it's kind of like this yin and yang, like lots of sun, less infrared coming out of the mitochondria, less sun, more infrared coming out of the mitochondria. Um, so basically the yeah the mitochondria are these infrared generators that are structuring all this water in our cell back to the the question of you know the fourth phase water and what is it really it's this structured water that can carry tremendous amounts of electricity electrical charge so basically this this whole idea is is basically showing all the work of Pollock and it's all these pieces and and Ling and stuff and and Cruz putting a lot of pieces together it's basically showing that we the water in our cells isn't just this bulk water like in a glass. It's highly structured. It's completely different from what we think of water as, completely different. And it basically is the carrier of life energy. And it, when the proteins are unfolded by ATP, they bind to this. Basically, they're exposed to this network of water and they're basically hydrated. And then they can carry out all their reactions based on the energy provided by this 
I don't even know what the term is for it that Ling and them used, um, but we could call it like this superconducting uh, network of water that makes up our whole body and and that that's how life really works. And that is what powers the, you know, hundred fold deficit that Ling found in his research of what ATP provides energetically, physically versus what cells actually are using so and his work is amazing and i recommend people just go to the website i believe it's still up he had a website called dobar.org d-a-o-b-a-r.org and uh, he passed away though no it looks like it's gone I, you could we could gilbert google search gilbert ling uh, it's, it's a shame that he passed away because he's a true true genius oh gilbertling.org actually looks like that might be there still yep it's there people can go on and pull up all of his pdfs and some really fascinating fascinating articles so i think we're on to something <laughs> that was awesome yeah and for, for years i've been fascinated with the that idea of like making our own light and um that point you just made about people at the equator not releasing as much infrared light not generating it is fascinating to me um I've been playing around the last year with a sensory deprivation uh, float tank <laughs> where you're floating in you know, 1,200 pounds of magnesium salt and there's not one photon hitting your, your skin um, and no sound. So it's a very unique environment and you're weightless. And what's interesting is I can actually see light in there and I don't know – Oh, where it's coming love from that, that you're saying that so but that's <laughs> dude this is beautiful this is so beautiful so that's what the light diet the, the step eight of the light diet is cultivate your inner light because that's the most important of all of it a hundred thousand times over you could get all the sun in the world but if the spine isn't straight if the soul isn't free of sin which sin in the bible is just people say sin it's like you sinned you did this like as if it's a bad thing sin is just somewhere where basically like from what i've been learning about consciousness and energy like where our soul is no longer fully straight like i think of the soul as like a straight line of the spine anytime we sin we create a kink where energy can't flow most freely because we block pure love with something that isn't pure love like hatred or fear usually a lot of the time it comes out of fear people do something and anytime there's a fear there it blocks the pure flow of light at its at its greatest potential. Anyway, so I, I, when you say that, it's fascinating. This is a cool thing, and it's good for you if you're seeing light. That's kind of a cool thing. Um, in the Bible, and Joe Dispenza talks about this quote at some of his events, which I've been going to recently to kind of geek out on all this spiritual inner light stuff because he's kind of like the main expert tying like, you know, science and, and neuro – endocrinology and all the stuff with like ancient yogic practices, even though he doesn't talk about that stuff so much because most of the people out in the world like will be like, Shh, don't talk to me about that because um, of, you know, preconceptions and everything. But one of the quotes he puts on the screen is that Matthew says that they, they sat in great, they sat in darkness and they saw great light. Like basically these meditators, these saints, these people who were practicing the way of Jesus would sit in darkness and they'd see great light. And so that's got to be like either our inner light or some kind of cosmic light energy that you're tapping into that isn't actually light, but that your basically pineal gland is picking up. And it's because there's no photon stimulating your retina, right? None. You said it yourself. So basically, there's no photon stimulating your retina. Something, the visual centers are being stimulated with some kind of energy, which it makes sense. And this is what Dispenza's whole work about is that the pineal gland is the transducer for basically cosmic energy. And, and, and we can see not just light even sometimes, but visions and patterns and sacred geometry. And dude, keep doing that. <laughs> if that's what you're seeing when you go in there, I want to know more, you know, like I want to know what you see if you stay there for an hour and you start really tapping into the light and seeing what it's saying to you. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's super fascinating. That's interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember years that's ago, I watched from what you were saying, actually, though, because you're saying our mitochondria generate infrared light. It's true. They also are generate generating infrared, which we can't see. But mm. I, I wonder if that infrared light that maybe it can be seen. And maybe that's what you're seeing. But I don't think it is. I think what you're seeing is a different kind of light. It's a more spiritual light. Anyway, sorry. To no, you. yeah. No, <laughs> no, that connects. Yeah. Years ago, when I was listening to David Wilcock a lot, um, kind of think of him differently now. I don't know. He's it's always like carrot on the stick now. It's like, oh, disclosure is coming and this is coming. And it's, um, I think he's doing that marketing thing. But he had a great lecture on the pineal gland that I saw years ago. And he was saying it actually has rods and cones. And I was introduced to that idea. And there are actually studies on that. Um, 
non-visual photoreceptors of the deep brain, pineal organs, and retina. 2002 article. And do you um, have that study? Are you looking at it right now? Or yeah, can you forward yeah. that to me, please? <laughs> yeah, I, I will send that. I will send that to Joe Dispenza immediately. And I think he, <laughs> he hasn't already read that. He will be like, Oh my gosh, this is awesome! Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and um, I know our cells make ultraviolet light and. In the context of lipofuscin, which I think you've seen me talk about quite yeah, a bit in the last few years, about for sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. Adam Bergstrom introduced me to it, and um, Ray Pete and Adam's written I think eleven books, ebooks on it. But basically, it's a glycated iron, aluminum, excess estrogen, and um, oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acid products, um, like a acrolein and different things. Um, basically in like a polymer like material. And what's very interesting is it accumulates largely in the heart, the liver, the eyes, and the brain. And in the eyes, it's specifically in the RPE cells of the eye, (laughs) which is fascinating coming from Jack's world where I was taking a lot of DHA and and looking Mm. into the sun. Um, Yeah, not a good idea probably. (laughs) And this this age pigment, as it's called, is very, uh, it has a relationship to green and blue light. I think when it's excited, it, it emits green and it actually absorbs blue wavelength light and mm. that causes it to kind of spread. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I was just. I'm definitely try- super interested in that. I'd, lo- I'd love to learn more because like, you know, I, I always thought for the longest time that like DHA, the omega-3 fatty acid that is like a primary building block of. And correct me if I'm wrong about this too. If you if there's something you don't you, you know about this that I don't, but basically, like to my understanding, based on my research, DHA is a pretty foundational building block of specifically the myelin sheathing around our nerves, and so it seems to have a very useful evolutionary purpose as far as being able to conduct and transduce light energy and transmute not yet yeah, yet yeah, basically to conduct light energy and and allow it to become sort of like electrical energy in the form of all the electrons but what i do find interesting is that yeah it is a very delicate molecule and in under exposure to strong strong sunlight um or even not super strong sunlight that it could become oxidized and damaging to the cells if it's not especially if it's not in the correct package like intuitively i never ever have taken fish oil because i thought it just a horrible idea like any any even algae any and this is part of where like you know i didn't i wasn't a big purchaser of MitoLife, you know, just because I, or not MitoLife, but whatever it was, the product that was the DHA that I don't, I don't think you're selling anymore based on what you're telling me. Um, and I just, but that aside, I just wasn't, I was like, mm, this doesn't seem like a good idea. The thing of getting it from fish at least made me think like, maybe it's somehow more protected from oxidation. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but so yeah, yeah I'm totally, what I'm trying to say is I'm totally like, interested in and open to this line of thinking which once in my past i was much more like nope i think i understand how these things work i totally didn't um and i'm 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 interested to learn more about life life of fuskin i always thought it was pronounced like lipofusin or something where it was just like not as awkward of a word but i'm like (laughs) sounds sounds really problematic well it's cool to say that you mentioned that blue light affects it too because then i'm like well people can at least protect their eyes with the glasses when they need to um but you know interesting anyway <laughs> no yeah, that's great um yeah re- repeat i think spearheaded the whole questioning like he has some great articles on um on unsaturated fats um unsaturated vegetable oils unsaturated fatty acids nutritionally essential or toxic and um yeah it's my understanding if you become quote efa deficient your body will make the more stable omega-9 meat acid um, so your body can actually make something that's better when you're not consuming it. But yeah, going back to what you said with fish, absolutely. I'm a fan of fish. I eat it still. And I think the vitamin E in it balances it out. And, uh, yeah. it's not only a chain breaking antioxidant, but it has a lot of effects, um, that are very protective, um, specifically with lipofuscin, like they'll actually give synthetic vitamin E, uh, to fish that they're feeding, like Whoa. fish oils too, <laughs> pufas to keep them alive longer. And so, um, Whoa. yeah, <laughs> yeah, Whoa. there's a lot to the story, but I think what it comes I down to, to learning about it, it's fascinating. Yeah. 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 Um, 
let's see. We can jump into some questions here because we have quite let's a few. Let's go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had a bunch on PBM, photobiomodulation, red light therapy, um, making your own at home. And I think that's relevant in the context of what yeah. we're talking about because people think, I don't know, there's some people that think it's they're not necessary at all. And then there are some people that like can't live without it. I'm somewhere in the middle where like, I think it's a very useful thing to have, especially if you're someone like me in North Idaho, where, you know, we don't get light for a good amount of time, five, six months where it's very dim. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I, um, so let's see. I think that the sun is the a really good thing for people to use at a basic, basic level for light therapy. I do see the value of red light therapy panels. It's something that I've toyed with and I'm still toying with potentially uh, developing as a business and mm -hmm. selling through raw optics to allow people to get a hit of the most biologically active wavelengths of red light. Um, I've also toyed with, you know, um, creating or working with co a company that develops like full spectrum, more full spectrum red and near infrared light therapy devices like sauna space. I recently connected with a guy from sauna space who's really amazing. Brian Richards, in fact, interview him. If you want to talk about photobiomodulation, oh my God, you guys will geek out. And he's so cool. He's like one of the coolest guys, same, similar age as you, like just the coolest guy. I'm serious. Um, so put a pin there photobiomodulation, specifically infrared, he will go super deep, like deeper than I can even go. But at a high level, you know, sunlight has it all. Best to use sunlight. And it also has the circadian effects and the ultraviolet, which has the vitamin D effects, and green, which has other effects related to red blood cells and hemoglobin and iron. Like all these wavelengths of light cover some biological process. And the reason I think so, I've thought about this a lot, is that – the sun is basically the artist of life and the rays of light that the artist uses are the different palettes of color on the artist's paintbrush. And basically the, the light of the painter, the sun, basically created the painting of life. And the painting of life is an ongoing, living, active um, – it's an active – there's a word I, I always look for when I'm trying to describe this process. It's alive. It's active. I'll find the word eventually. It'll come to me. But basically, it is moving. It is not stagnant. It is adaptive. Mobile. Adaptive. I'll find it. No, it's not quite adaptive, <laughs> but I'll, I'll get the word. It might not even be an existing word, but it's it's relevant to, to this process. But people get the idea. It is, it is the opposite of stagnant. In fact, I just got to look up stagnant antonyms right now just so this doesn't bug me. Um, and, and so for this reason – we don't need to be just exposed to light one time. The picture's painted and it's done. No, it's, it is much, much more active and ongoing. And so therefore we need the consistent replenishment of this light energy from the sun. I mean, again, I believe that based on what I've been learning about like the Yogi masters and all the spiritual light work, that it's possible that the most advanced meditators and yogis could basically lose any need for even sunlight because they become so effective at channeling just pure cosmic energy. Because there are monks and yogis and saints who haven't gone outside in 20 years. They just sit in pure meditation. But if you did that for most people, you would rot away because that's why, that's why people go to prison, to jail, because they become docile because they don't get enough sunlight, especially why prisons were always sequestered in basements. You make someone – really really talk about a good way to make someone docile sequester them in a basement in in the dungeon you know if you leave someone outside and they're a villain or someone you don't like or an enemy like they're gonna just keep their energy because they're out in the sun put them put them in the right. basement they'll wear away unless they're a meditate made it made you know advanced meditative yogi so anyhow um in this analogy of light from the sun or, or the the sun being this painter we have every single every single color that the painter had on his palette, the sun, is something that would be used to develop function because why wouldn't you? It's free energy. And so like if you have this range of light – and we can see that biologically if we look. The wavelengths of light that affect life, that affect humans even, 
or I should say, are, they're the exact same ones that reach the Earth. In other words, the wavelengths of light that reach the Earth are not X rays and gamma rays and all these. We don't we don't have any use for those things. We haven't figured out how to. In fact, they become harmful to us, like X rays, gamma rays, and all these high level radiations and so on. Even radio frequencies and lower level wavelengths of light that also don't come to the Earth in large amounts from the sun. These are also disruptive to us because they're not native. That's what people talk about non native electromagnetic fields they're not native so cut all that stuff away that does come out of the sun but doesn't reach earth because it doesn't make it through the atmosphere it's really just infrared red orange yellow green blue violet ultraviolet a b some c rarely when the sun's its strongest and that's it that's basically all and occasionally solar flares will bring us a little more radiation and this and that and the other thing if you go up in a plane and you're further away from the atmosphere then you're getting a lot more of the cosmic radiation which can be damaging to cells so basically, that's the light that comes to Earth. You have four billion years of evolution to develop to, for – it's not even that evolution has a mind of its own to have some specific outcome that it's trying to achieve. The energy coming in is driving the reactions of molecules that are basically catalyzing what I would call catalyzing the, the – outcome of what the universe is going for. Because from a physical perspective, the universe wants to be uh, – like kind of wants to get to entropy, right? But when there's energy present, it looks like temporarily life defies entropy because everything wants to be disorganized ultimately in the, in the end, at least so it seems. I don't necessarily know if that's true or not, but that's the theory of entropy, that everything just tends towards entropy, right? The second law of thermodynamics. Unless you have an energy source that temporarily suspends things outside of entropy. So humans, we're sort of riding this wave of energy that's keeping us suspended from returning to entropy. And because as long as that energy is there, we kind of have to do it. And it sounds, when I speak about this, it sounds a lot like the laws of karma and all this, like we have to go through the cycle, but it's the same thing they're speaking about. And so it's funny, I saw a parallel recently that, because from the very, very biomechanical, bio, not mechanical, but biochemical reductionist viewpoint, I was looking at the world through a couple of years ago. I actually made my little quote on Facebook for some reason, because I thought it was profound. I said, with every breath, we satisfy the universe a little bit further because that's what we're doing. We're satisfying the universe by taking hydrogen, reacting with oxygen, making water. We're lowering the energy there and taking and, and using that energy for ourselves, but ultimately it's being dissipated in the end. And so I realized that like all these different biblical scriptural teachings, isn't that Hindu and the, all of them, they, they all talk about pleasing God. And I was like, wait a minute, wait, 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 satisfy the universe, please God. I was like, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. And I own that only hit me like two days ago as I went back and looked at my my old Facebook like little description thing. And then I was reading the spiritual book where the guy said that his only goal is always to please God in every moment to the highest of his ability. It was pretty interesting stuff. But um, so so kind of going down a tangent there. The point about photobiomodulation in, in light is that if the sun, it's it's this energy. It's, it's going to be utilized if possible, and it has been in humans. If you look every single wavelength, the whole spectrum, not every single wavelength necessarily, but every color has been shown to have some effect. If you look into the literature, there's some effect for the most part. Again, so infrared, quick summary, infrared, most important for life probably because it, it's based on Nick Lane's theories of where life began at these vents at the bottom of the ocean and Jack Cruz and all these things like basically – it was infrared light that was the most foundational at that time, at the base of life and the formation of the most fundamental primitive cells. It was infrared light that was driving it. And this is where it just back to Gilbert Ling versus Nick Lane and these, you know, modern biochemistry, Western reductionist views versus like the more holistic Gilbert Ling thinking. I don't think that the idea that life evolved from the bottom of the oceans is necessarily wrong, but they're just arguing about, um, and that's what Nick Lane's idea is. But Gilbert Ling's just saying, Yes, this is how it happened, and you're missing this extra view of the picture that answers questions that you haven't been able to answer that you don't see because you haven't expanded your consciousness. I think that's what Gilbert Ling is saying to these other researchers effectively. Like, like there's all these things that you guys can't explain, and you don't know why you can't explain them, and it's because there's this other thing that you're not willing to accept because it challenges certain other fundamental beliefs that you have. But so anyway, infrared light. Is, is essential for many reasons, structures water and optimizes mitochondrial function and all these different things. So that's critical. Then you have red, which also optimizes and dials in mitochondria and improves skin health and all these other things. Then you have, so orange, yellow, I haven't dug honestly nearly as deep into these colors, 
uh, red, orange, yellow, green. Green has been shown to have some effects on like hemoglobin, mitochondria, or I should say not mitochondria, hemoglobin, red blood cells, and so on. Again, haven't dug super deep into green yet. Um, these intermediate colors are something I'm looking very much forward to diving into more. But then we get to the other side of the spectrum. We get into um, blue. And we get into, you know, it's interesting. I'll just make a note as I think about it. If you if you look at the spectrum of light too, like how much of each color, as we call it, occupies different wavelengths, blue and red are the vast majority of the spectrum. Like green, orange, and yellow are actually very small slits. And these color names and perceptions are just our brain's perception for differentiating it. So it's really not so relevant, like the names we ascribe to them. It's just throughout the spectrum of light, it's clear that a vast majority of it is being utilized for biological processes. And so in the blue portion of the spectrum, blue light has been, it's the big thing is the circadian rhythm. It sets our circadian rhythm. It has other effects as well, but it, um, you know, both negative and positive, but you know, so can all of the light if you get too much of it or too little. So blue setting the circadian rhythm, which is our biological time system through our eyes and our skin. So that's important. Then you get an ultraviolet and ultraviolet, ultraviolet especially, it gets super interesting, like looking at how UVB is used to make vitamin D. And this is essential for the body. And there's no, def there's no denying this, but what's so, so fascinating about how light affects the body is everyone's just like, oh, like. I'm going to get the sun and I'm going to get vitamin D because I'm like, do you really think that the only thing that the sun does for us is vitamin D? Like how likely is it that like if, if we're using like one single wavelength of ultraviolet B to make vitamin D, that that's the only energy from the sun that our body has determined to use for productive processes. It's, it's insane. Like the infrared is probably more important in, in a big way. The blue is essential too. Um, ultraviolet has been shown that even our cells em emit ultraviolet light there's this book biophotons or it's called light in shaping life or light shaping life biophotons in biology and medicine fascinating textbook fascinating book um some of the deepest science i've read and i read this several years ago but inspired me so much as a kid who was learning about this stuff like our cells literally emit light and communicate with light so all this spiritual woo woo that people call woo woo it's actually probably true that the things that the yogi masters and the Taoist, the Taoist masters in China found about how to cultivate our inner light, they're probably all pretty on point with, you know, 5,000 years of generational experience and refining of these things to optimize our health. So I always recommend people go that direction if it calls them. But so I, the reason I'm giving this whole explanation, Matt, is just because like, we're asking about photobiomodulation. It's like people need to understand like the sun is literally like the painter and we need all of the colors that he painted us with to maintain our vibrancy. And so um, that's that's why it's like, okay, red light therapy, great, do it. Go out in the sun too because if you're not, it's going to be affecting you. Uh, and cultivate your inner light too because if you're not, then it's going to be affecting you a lot. That was amazing. And yeah, I'm glad you brought up vitamin D um, I had a few episodes on, uh, secosteroid hormone D it's his real name and, uh, Morley and Jim Stevenson jr. Were on my podcast. And one thing I appreciate about you is that you've spoke out against supplementing hormone D for many years. And, um, I've had whole podcasts on it, on its, on its harmful effects, and it'll actually cause disease and, um, it'll cause hypercalcification because it increases calcium. Uh, uptake in the gut and it actually depletes liver retinol. So it'll actually deplete vitamin A. And if you don't have vitamin A, then you can't actually convert thyroid hormone or load copper into active copper ceruloplasmin. So like retinol tanks and just all the, it, it throws everything out of balance to supplement vitamin D. So I'm really glad that you brought that up because you actually get lumisterol from sunlight and it's, it's, pre D3 and it's so much more important and you can make uh, th that's way better than supplementing. Cause if you supplement D3, it could actually get stored as D3 and build up to toxic levels. And it's actually an ingredient in rat poison. Uh, that, that's how the, you kill that. rats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Colate calciferol, uh, this stops the kidneys, but you made me think of, uh, Adam again and Roy G Biv and he's big into color therapy color recycling he calls it for traumas and he got oh, me on yeah. wearing he got me on wearing colors for certain days so like roy g biv apply that to monday through sunday and so you know red on monday 
orange on Tuesday. Sounds and like he a was, great idea. Keep the colors, <laughs> like get an equal balance of colors. Like just on, on the surface, I don't know anything about it. I'm like, that, that could be cool. You know, <laughs> I've heard of devices from a guy. I interviewed this guy named Dr. Chris Shade. You may be familiar with him. He's mm-hmm. a big supplement guy who, who does Quicksilver, but he had some really fascinating perspectives about different things. And um, basically, you know, many things you might disagree with because of the, the, the nature of products, or maybe not. Maybe there are certain things that are aligned, but anyhow, um, he mentioned that he has these German light researcher friends, you know, probably people I've heard of or read their, some of their work or books or whatever. Um, but he said like they created this device that would cause basically like r- somehow like perfectly reflect biophotons or something so that like, but only reflect the ones that are either polarized or not polarized. I don't remember. But so basically like if our bodies, again, it, it's, if our body's emitting polarized or unpolarized light, again, I forget which one it is. It's actually on the podcast I did with him. One of the two is harmful for the body. Like it, or it, 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 it basically shows that there's disease occurring. It shows that there's imbalance. And so basically this device or whatever, this mirror type thing, this device they're developing makes it so that the ones that are um, like, it's basically reflects back to the body, everything that it needs and doesn't reflect back anything of what it um, doesn't need. It's like, so, so it sees where you're deficient and basically gives you more of that naturally. It was a super fascinating concept. And I'm, I'm not sure if it was just reflection or if it was also producing light itself, but like basically like a mirror that shows you exactly where you're lacking and gives you back exactly what you need. Like it's fascinating stuff. And I, I'm really, uh, I think that's cool. So the color therapy stuff, I think it's amazing. Wunsch, Dr. Wunsch, who's like one of the great mm. sunlight guys today, who's been on a lot of the podcasts and stuff. He's based out of Germany. He does that and he, he helps mm. people with that. It's super cool. That's really cool. You you reminded me of uh, my friend over at Gamba Red. He sells Imana yarn clothes, like uh, shirts that are embedded with like nano ceramics, which sounds bad at a surface level. But the good thing is there's studies on it that show that it reflects 93% of IR light back mm. to you, which I think is really cool in the winter. Like I can't wear them now or else I'd sweat to death. But <laughs> wearing them in the winter, uh, it does keep me warm and gives me i feel like some energy and supposed well, to isn't that cool stuff. to think about like that you could now humans brain gets big enough so we realize okay well we need infrared okay <laughs> well why not put on a bunch of clothing in, when it's cold as shit because we can now survive in a colder environment under harsher circumstances with basically not having to tax our energy systems as much you know we put on this big heavy thing that a bear uses is bear you know skin or whatever and and it reflects back the infrared into our body just the same way the bear did so it just saves energy it literally just saving some work from the body that it has to do now again i think it's interesting though this again is like a cruise uh ism i think but the, the native americans were literally in like loincloths when the settlers showed up like loincloths in the dead of the winter like freezing so they're probably and they might have had access to the technology to have the the warm stuff and maybe they just didn't want it because i i do have this uh idea it's not just my idea but it seems clear that when someone's r- ridiculously healthy like at our highest level of health like high redox potential great functioning mitochondria we could basically not um need that because it's just so easy for us to just kick off infrared heat and and do this uncoupling in our mitochondria to stay warm and in the depth of winter and this is like wim hof is a perfect example he'd be like why would you want to wear more clothes like I feel better because it does like su- sort of supercharge the mitochondria by having the cold, but I could see why, like, again, humans would want to have maybe a break, you know, like it's fun. It makes you feel good, but maybe constantly it is burning. You're br- basically, if you think about purely evolutionarily, I mean, to, to get that heat, it might be like from a Wim Hof perspective or a Jack Cruz perspective, it might be really beneficial to have like doses of, of that training, basically that metabolic stimulus of the cold, um, and optimizing that it doesn't it isn't just metabolic jack cruz would always argue which is fascinating it's it's not hormetic it's not just it's like a little thing it actually changes the chemistry and the the physiology and the and the physics of cells and how the water works in them and everything it's fascinating how mitochondria work and the light and all the energy so it's not just like oh you get a little cold it stresses you out and strengthens you know like if you spend more time in the cool like it's really good for the body um in in certain respects but again we can also survive in the heat too it's just for people with loosely coupled mitochondria like who are Northern Europeans, it's really good to get in the cold. Um, at the same time, if you're a wild human, you're burning, the, the more cold you have, you're burning off your fat stores. So putting on that big thing could keep you from having to use more of your fat and keep you alive longer if you're starving to death. So it's, I, I, you know, it's a pretty solid theory. It's not my theory. It's just science. Um, yeah, so it's a very interesting stuff. 
and you inspired me to uh, break open my lake this winter and dive oh, in. I mean, yes. I don't know how cold it'll get, but uh, I think the booty, like I used to do the gloves and the booties, and it's amazing how much that helps. Just like oh, yeah. covering your hands and feet with like neoprene and a beanie, right? Because yeah. that's, you just want to get your torso large. Yeah. Like, well, I would probably, I, I would just do all of them because like you'll mm-hmm. cool the body faster by having your hands in. So it's like, oh. it, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I would just do it raw. Yeah. And just do it as long as you can raw and then, and then keep building that up. Cause it's ultimately like putting on the booties and the gloves. is just lowering the amount of cooling that's happening. So mm. from a hormetic effect, cause there is still a hormetic effect present. I, I believe, um, you might not need the hands and the feet. You might just want to get the face a lot, especially, mm. but for the physiologic, like deeper benefits, probably having the actual body getting a little bit cool more cool but you know just mm. try it however you want if you need to start with the booties and gloves like do it i like i think it's funny booties it always was funny to me the idea of like surfers who wear wetsuits they wear booties like it's just funny that for neoprene boots they're always called booties i'm like can we just call them boots <laughs> like i put on my with gloves and boots like you do when you walk outside it's just funny booties <laughs> anyway yeah when I was, it's amazing though how warm this could be like oh, uh i found the word i was missing sorry what is it <laughs> dynamic life is okay. dynamic so the, the word it's so when i was looking for, like something that's constantly moving and changing and needs to be replenished it's dynamic life is dynamic mm-hmm. and so that's why we can't just be one time we get sun and we're painted in the funk the system runs from there on food energy no we require the input in order to maintain the level of complexity that we've evolved to we require the continuous input of what evolved what allowed us to get there. Right. And so we keep getting that light in and that's super useful for the body. And I believe my, my other theory is that humans today are like 10% of what humans can be like that our capacity for greatness and, and, um, sort of divinity as what some would call it like this much, in other words, that we are unlimited beings and that we have much more power to transcend the physical world than we think and then there's all these yogis and stuff of course which i keep repeating because i'm fascinated by them who talk about getting into the astral plane and being in this different world and you realize like the physical plane is just like a it's like a drama and i buy into it all the time i get i buy into it more than most people most of the time i'd say or you know i'm worrying about my business and different things all you know just things i got to do but nonetheless it's fascinating to think we could go beyond so I love it. No, that's amazing. And uh, I wanted to, I think this quote's um, shared often in, in this kind of conversation, but Albert St. Georgie, 1937, a living cell requires energy, not only for all of its functions, but also for the maintenance of its structure. And so what you're talking about, this organization um, coming from energy, you're, what you're saying is that energy should largely come from sunlight because we're cutting out the middleman. We don't need to generate as much free radicals we age ourselves when we eat Mm -hmm. you know yeah Yeah. you know what's funny is i this is like the the things you remember from like your childhood or from like whatever that just stick out you probably have i mean i imagine you'd have things like this i think most people probably do i'm only starting to tap back into it more because i'm realizing the divinity of certain visions and certain things i had as a kid that have affected my life profoundly now because i didn't give them the awareness and attention that they needed um that's separate. But so one is a friend of mine's older brother who I always looked up to and thought was really cool. He came back from school one day and he shared this fact like that he had either read on Facebook or his teacher had told him like something that just really fascinated him. And he and he shared it with me and it struck me like crazy. I've never stopped thinking about it since then. He said like, and I tried to break it apart and, and dismiss it, but he's like, you know, like basically like eating and, and digestion is what ages us. And he's like, this guy's like, I was like, 10 or 11 or 12 and he was like 14 so i was like he's the cool kid you know he's in high school now like i'm like in middle school or even even younger he was in middle school i was in elementary school i was like probably 10 he was probably 12 he's like yeah like basically the only reason we age is because of digestion like basically the, the digestive process is what we age if you could if you could go without eating at all you could live forever and i was like interesting and and totally just like that doesn't i don't think that's possible but as i've started learning about everything that i've been learning about the light diet and then like trans moving now it's it's forced me clearly into a more spiritual path of like the yogis and stuff it's like wait a minute like they're talking about these ancient masters who some of them who become immortal and people are going to think this is woo woo bs but like there are 
apparently immortal souls, like people whose soul still remains on this earth for just the purpose of helping other souls to get to where they've gotten and they haven't transcended out of the of this planet, which again, it sounds super questionable. And I question it myself. I'm open to it, you know? It interests me at least. But it's like there, you know, we maybe we could live forever. And maybe, and this is what Boros talks about, like in the Bible, they talk about like if you go through Genesis or like it, one of the chapters in Genesis, they're like listing out the chronology of of the um, basically the lineage that led to Jesus. And it's like there's like pages and pages and pages. And I was, I've like just read the Bible just because it's something that fascinated me. I wasn't raised Christian or anything. It's just I'm like, OK, well, one of the most significant books of all of Western all, all history in the world and the most significant book of all of Western civilization, eh, maybe give it a read should be might maybe relevant. All great literature of all time everything my name is matthew it's all based on the bible like maybe there's something about this book that people don't want us reading you know hmm right the spiritual light mm -hmm. and connecting to yourself and love maybe that's a message that and and that, that's trying to be suppressed it's not about the catholic church it's not about any of that it's about truth but anyhow hopefully maybe I'm, someone's being inspired by this message so i started reading the bible and it's like they're talking about the lineages and the people in the bible are living for like five or six hundred years and i'm like were there years different? Like, was the sun in a different position? Like, did it go faster around the, or the earth go faster around the sun back then? Like, are we drifting away from the sun? And so we we're going around faster. Like, I'm just, just in my head, I'm joking. I didn't really think these things even, I just, it's just an idea. No, like it, maybe they did live that long, you know, or maybe they didn't, but maybe they did. And if they did, wouldn't it be cool to understand how the hell that happened, you know, in a human body with human DNA? Is it possible? Anyway, this is the kind of stuff we're into, obviously. Uh, no, I love it. Yeah, that's a big been a big focus of mine is extreme longevity and anti aging. And I think you can get lost in supplement land in biohacks and devices with that because I don't think you can achieve it with those things alone. You need, I think, community is very important. You know, uh, keeping your stress low, doing what you want to do in life. There's so much more to health than water totally. and nutrition and the things that we tend to focus on, but. I had a random question for you. We just set up a wood burning with a wood stove and, and stones uh, barrel sauna outdoor, like an off grid barrel sauna. And I fell in love with it because all I've used up until this point was like a electric bar infrared, you know, wooden sauna. Um, if you had to choose between the two, would you go for the, for the wood stove steam sauna versus a, a dry electric uh, I would go for wood a hundred percent. The reason mm -hmm. being that it's more full spectrum infrared, I would think. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know a lot about how the electrics work, but I'm assuming from what I know, there's, I've seen these before cause they're a typical sauna, right? Like it has the mm -hmm. hot rocks that get heated by a, a coil. It's probably still pretty good because the electricity is being used to heat up a rod of some kind of metal that basically then becomes incandescent. So it's basically in the same way, like there's fluorescent lights, like this is, it's incandescing, incandescing. Mine's actually, um, it, it's fully off grid. So there's no electric. So it's just the oh, stones are being heated directly by the flames, like direct. Oh, <laughs> wait, wait. So, but, but what was the other option? So wait, one's, let's. Oh, just, and then one's just the black lines. panels that you normally see in the, in the, in the wood sauna, like it, you know, that you, we used it like uh, Ben's house, you know. Okay, like you okay. Should. So I, I think I misunderstood them. So they're both – you're both burning wood on both, right? I'm sorry. No, no. So, so let's say like a, a clear light sauna versus an off-grid wood oh, stove. 100% off-grid yeah. wood stove. <laughs> yeah. yes. No yeah. question. It's more – I think it's – I mean I'm going to bet it's more full spectrum. Again, with the clear light, I don't, I, I don't know exactly the spectrum that it puts off, but I'm going to say fire – any any day of the week is going to be better than things because it has this really full spectrum of of infrared light but again the clear light people they might say listen matt you don't know what you're talking about you know there's these wavelengths and to be honest i haven't studied the specific wavelengths emitted by these different saunas it's not something i've gotten super deep into so it's worth yeah. evaluating i would say um yeah and i didn't mean to i'm not bashing that brand i was just using it. that's one of the most popular ones but yeah that's a good oh, yeah. point maybe i'm maybe i'm getting some green light from the flame right i don't know <laughs> yeah well no, flames, I think flames would be good. I think fire is really good. It's something that was so primitive for humans for so long that like, I love fire. 
And that's why when I started using uh, sauna space, the sauna space bulbs, mm-hmm. it's basically like a portable little fire thing that you can kind of carry with you and use. And it really feels like fire. And it's really, really cool. It's like a really mm-hmm. inspiring device. Um, so anyhow, I uh, I want to say before we sign off, just for people who are listening, the punchline, one of the punchlines is I just released the light diet in the form of a course. So if you want to get that, to understand the evolution of every everything I'm talking about and how I've gotten to this point and, and just the key takeaways. That's the light diet course that we just put together. And I started as I inferred or, or um, referred to as a blue light blocking glasses company called Raw. Currently, Raw Optics becoming just Raw. And so at Raw, we basically make glasses that are really, really amazing that block the light, that stimulates our circadian rhythm and disrupts our sleep. And more generally, a good way to put it is it takes – man-made dis- distorted harmful artificial light sources and basically just filters out the part that is the most damaging so that we can get less of a negative effect and more of a beneficial effect so it turns harmful light just into like red light therapy and in like yeah red light therapy through the eyes basically so that's really fun and awesome and uh, people can use that like basically to relax naturally. Like when you wear the glasses, you relax naturally. You don't need any more to drink alcohol. You don't need to smoke weed. You don't need a lot of things that people normally need because of artificial light. The, se- the second thing they do besides relaxing is they help you sleep better. So you don't need to take melatonin pills anymore. You don't need to use Ambien. You don't need to use whatever else, Tempur-Pedic mattress or sleep number mattress that adjusts this. It just becomes less necessary when uh, I still recommend people use a chili pad if they want because that's pretty cool, and that also affects physiology in a positive way. They're they're great people over at Chili Pad, but um, I'm not even affiliate for them, but maybe I am. If I am, the code would be Raw Optics, so use that. But I, I don't I don't know if I am. Um, but so then the third thing is that they give you you get more energy when you use the product, the sleep lenses that we we offer, the red ones. This with improving your sleep, you wake up with more energy, and so now you don't need, you don't need to use coffee anymore. It's not, it's just, you, you can still use it if you want, but you don't, you won't have to be dependent on coffee when you start optimizing your circadian rhythm. You will no longer have to drink Red Bulls or, or even maybe smoke cigarettes. If you use the screen lenses when you're indoors and you're all wired, you need a cigarette just to chill out. When you start just chilling out with light naturally and getting more natural sunlight, which is the light diet course, you combine that with the glasses. Very important. Um, very, very useful for people to kind of get started onto this light optimization path, which relates to a lot of things we were speaking about today. Um, because if, if our circadian rhythm isn't working properly and we're not getting correct, healthy amounts of sun, which is what the light diet course explains more than anything, then we can have a lot of issues with the mitochondria not functioning at their highest level and our cells basically not being able to be in our water, not being able to be the antenna for the light that it's supposed to be. And then we're going to need to eat a bunch more food, bad food, and just life's going to be a little bit harder. I'll just put it that way. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I highly recommend your glasses. I still have, I think, the yellow and red ones that I bought from you like three or four years ago. And like I said, um, we have to get you the new ones. I don't know what I've been doing <laughs> since we spoke last time. I got to get that set up. Yeah. And you and you named them after uh, like Fritz Albert Pop and like Doug Wallace, right? These scientists mm-hmm. that yeah, these studied light. That's yes. awesome. Yeah. And, and what makes... Cool. What makes yours special again versus other lenses? Like you use a special coating, right, on them? Or? Yeah. So the main thing is that I mean, the the biggest thing is that the lenses that are being sold as blue light glasses today, and even some for sleep, literally block like nothing. They block fractions of the spectrum that is relevant because what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it so that they're trying to make it so that people. Uh, don't have to have a colored lens, but the magic is in the color of the lens. So basically the color of the lens, which we accomplish, the way we accomplish it too is is different from any of the other companies. So I'm talking about like 95% of blue light glasses are clear lenses. They claim to work and they're literally placebo and they don't do anything. Our lenses, you can feel the effects. And there's a couple other companies also doing colored lenses. What makes us different from theirs, which people don't need to really worry about that because all you need to know is that the the real issue is the clear lenses. But just to get into it a little bit deeper for those who are curious, is we've worked with a particular gentleman and researchers in general who spent basically their entire lives dedicating to how dedicated to how melanin, the pigment, can be utilized um, for other applications beyond just you know it's obviously natural in our body, but how it can be used for different things, um, whether it's skin creams or just different amazing applications. And specifically, we've used this same basically same 
uh, synthetic melanin to be the basis of our lens pigments. So no other lens on the market is using me a synthetic melanin, like a melanin-like pigment as the base of the lens. So through this, we're able to accomplish a really, really, if you look at um, basically the spectral reading of the lenses, it's a very smooth curve that basically means that the light perception is most balanced and accurate. So the brain is able to, there's not like all these spikes and stuff. And I'm actually working on getting like a really nice graphically designed version of our spectral curve so people can see them. But you can, you know, go on my Instagram and see videos of me testing the stuff with my meters anyway. Um, but basically, that smooth curve is really, really important for clear, correct visual perception. So that's basically how what we're doing is different. And it's just something people should know. And the, the other thing is from the frame styles, like, my opinion, we have the best, most attractive frame styles. So someone can have something that they actually feel good about. And for the frames, just because I like, and and I my advisors, business advisors, like don't do this. It's like you're gonna you're gonna spend more money and and not make as much profit. Blah, blah, blah. It's like so I'm just like I want everything to be as good as it can. So like we use Italian acetate for the frames and German metal, which is like just the two highest quality best ingredients you can use to make this product. And so. It is the only blue block. It is the superior blue blocker on the market. Nothing compares to it um, as far as like ultimate quality and function. So mm -hmm. that's what we do at Raw Optics. And that's why I'm proud to be, you know, running the business. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I'm super stoked as we're looking at additional products and additional things we can be doing to make the world a better place. So super stoked. I love it, man. Well, thank you for everything that you're doing. And um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that blew my mind about the synthetic melanin. Um, it's I just really interviewed cool. it's a really interesting, yeah. I interviewed a chaga mushroom seller. He's up in Fairbanks, Alaska, and he sells uh, wild harvested chaga. And I guess chaga is the richest natural source of melanin. Uh, it's, it's in the black part of the chaga. Melanin's fascinating. So. We could have a whole other podcast about melanin <laughs> once I dig into the research. I will, and we'll, we'll have another podcast because there's one of the researchers out of Mexico City named Arturo Solis Herrera read a, wrote a really cool book called Melanin, the Master Molecule, which is like – a really, really interesting book um, that actually I've only skimmed. I haven't gone as deep as I'd like. That's why I'm saying when I get through his work, we've got to do another podcast. But basically, I get the gist of it from combining it with Pollux and other stuff. I don't want to say that. I understand the basics, let's say. Um, it's, it's basically, and Ben Greenfield read it and was recommending it to me. This is why. It's basically that melanin is like one of the main... It, again, this is a reductionist kind of limited view in a certain sense, but it's like reducing the whole thing down. But it's one of the key pieces like deuterium. Melanin takes high energy ultraviolet light or high energy even blue and slows the frequency down to infrared and re-emits it as infrared light. So basically, that's what melanin is doing. And, that, and, and basically, this guy, Arturo Solis Herrera, uh, was basically seeing that in his theory, not even knowing about Gerald Pollock's work, that melanin that, – using melanin the body splits the water molecule and basically creates this massive repository of free energy which is the exact same thing dr pollock is finding is that taking infrared light now he's not it's the one guy's talking about how we take the ultraviolet and then turn it into infrared and split it the other guy's just talking about the infrared so it's like all these pieces start to stack up and you're like whoa this is fascinating but anyhow so yeah melanin's super cool and obviously we can make it naturally and this is why one of the reasons why wearing sunglasses is a bad idea because it gets rid of this uvb stimulus on the eye to make more melan melanocytes naturally which is super bad but um yeah if you can take melanin in from chaga i think that's probably why one of the reasons it's so good do it you know <laughs> that's amazing yeah dr Dr. Sebi, I don't know if you've heard of him. He was a mm -hmm. recent fad, kind of like the carnivore thing, but from the vegan perspective where he, he died and there's this conspiracy about it, but he treated like John Travolta, Michael Jackson, a bunch of celebrities, and he was all about melanin and he was, he was a African-American guy. And so he kind of had this melanin spin on his health message. Like, you know, if you have more melanin, you're going to be healthier. That's kind of my kind of read on it. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Um, That's fascinating. That's super cool. Yeah. Well, this has yeah. been awesome. Um, people can find us on rawoptics.com and they can find, so raoptics.com and they can find me on the light, uh, the light diet on Instagram. So at the light diet and the Instagram for the business is also just raw optics, raw underscore optics. So check awesome. us out. 
go do it. And uh, if people buy a pair of uh, our screen and our sleep lenses, our two lens types, the main one that people should get is the sleep lenses. If you're confused, get sleep lenses. Don't think about it because they'll change your life the most. But if you're off- also in an office all day long, you can also get the screen lenses. But you can use the sleep lenses during the day in an office. They're just going to make you a little bit more tired. So I would use the screen lenses because they still give you the protection you need without um, – without you know, making you too tired and blocking more light, which is what the sleep lenses are for. So they have different mm-hmm. cases. That's why we, against the advice of some of my best advisors, we keep both of them because it would be, it'd be easier to market just the one and just go whoosh, bigger with the one that's clear, use it for this and done. But I really want to keep both so people can have the a- access to two amazing products like this. And if people buy t- d- screen and sleep together, previously called day and night lenses, um, then they get the free, the light diet course for free. So, which is normally a uh, hundred and forty seven dollars right now so good deal i love um, it all right oh, yeah I'll put, all, I'll put awesome. the links below too and yeah and people yeah. can use your affiliate uh like your your affiliate link or code um discount code should, should be blackburn right I think. yeah blackburn I'll, I'll double check and pull it up but let me um actually we we made it blackburn so it's blackburn I'll, i can change it after the podcast if it's not but yeah all right cool well this love has it. been awesome matt this Thanks, has been matt. one of my favorite conversations i'm super grateful this was super awesome. Yeah, stick around as we close out the show. We'll we'll do it course, again soon. Of course, yeah. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Well, that's it for today's show. I think Matt's doing awesome work, bringing more awareness to light and one's personal relationship to it. I think it's really important, and he has a great blog post on rawoptics.com kind of outlining what the light diet is and I'd agree with about 90% of this list one of my favorite sections is step 7 avoid man-made electronic pollution switch phone to airplane mode when not in use plug computer directly into the Wi-Fi router turn off the Wi-Fi when you sleep don't use wireless headphones mouse and keyboard and in the car connect the phone with a cord instead of bluetooth so a lot of really practical tips that don't cost you anything and the only thing that would cost you is buying your first pair of blue light blocking glasses which completely changed my life when i bought my first pair i started with a uvex plastic ten dollar orange glasses but it totally started to rewire my brain. I think we discount the effects that can occur from artificial light at night, not only from screens and monitors, but also light bulbs and light fixtures over our head. My experience over the years was that the more diligent I was about putting those on after the sun went down, the more sensitive I became if I forgot them in the car or I forgot them at home. And pretty soon I was never forgetting them because it was that foundational to always be able to mitigate this toxin, which is a form of EMF, which is artificial light. One of my favorite parts of this interview was when Matt talked about how people living on the equator release a lot less infrared light and that when you have sun, you don't need to make as much infrared light. That was really fascinating to me. And that concept is kind of 180 from what you would expect a healthy person's biofield to look like. I remember reading spiritual books and studying and going to conferences and talking with people. It's like you want to be as radiant as possible. You want to shine your light as brightest as possible. You want, you know, a bigger aura, all that stuff. And it's really the exact opposite that actually if you're leaking a lot of light out then that means that your body is under stress or maybe it's light deficient it's not getting the photonic food that it needs i recently saw an adam bergstrom post on social media where he was saying the healthiest person would have no aura at all i thought that was really fascinating and it's not esoteric at all because we emit uv light we emit IR light, infrared light. And I actually have a camera here at my desk that can measure that called a gas discharge visualization camera that measures the extreme low frequency UV light coming off of your fingertips. 
and it's a very real aspect of health. And I think it's a great way to even diagnose what's going on in the body. I also love that Matt's anti-supplementing secrosteroid hormone D, a.k.a. vitamin D, because I feel like this goes over people's heads, and it's just one of those things that they've been supplementing for so long that they don't question it, but I think it causes a lot of harm. And the way that Matt Maruka would describe to you that it causes your body harm is different from the way that I would describe it, different angles, but... I believe that it's just all around bad and there is no benefit to supplementing it. And I know that ruffles a lot of feathers, but I would just encourage you to keep an open mind that maybe the alternative health community doesn't have your best interests at heart and you have to do your own research and question why you're supplementing the same things that they're telling you on the major media news outlets to supplement that should be a big red flag right there that you're supplementing the very things that you're seeing on tv on the show the doctors or something you really have to dive to a deeper layer because once you get out of conventional medicine you're not out of the woods yet there's a whole nother trap which tells you to supplement zinc and ascorbic acid and omega-3s and vitamin d and iron and it all throws you out of balance mostly by screwing with oxygen utilization if you can't utilize oxygen properly that's like a foundational thing that will throw off your entire physiology this talk with matt inspired me to pick back up this book called mitochondria and the future of medicine by lee no and the subtitle is The Key to Understanding Disease, Chronic Illness, Aging, and Life Itself. It's a very dense read. I could only handle a few pages at a time because it's detailing out biochemistry at the mitochondrial level. And it gets pretty complicated. And it does have like a pro-ketogenic diet. And, you know, you're never going to agree with 100% of what's in a health book that you read. That's been my experience. So you just take what's good and you leave the rest. But I think it's helpful to understand the basic way that a cell works and the mitochondria works. And then from there, you could start looking into these books that Matt recommends by Roland Van Wyck, Light Shaping Life. And I think it makes a lot more sense. But he had some great book recommendations and I'm going to put the link below to that study that I mentioned, the non-visual photoreceptors of the deep brain, pineal organs, and retina. I remember growing up and in my bedroom just gazing up at the pitch black darkness and seeing tons of light. And that always stuck with me. I, my entire childhood, I was just wondering, how am I seeing light in the darkness? And same thing now with sensory deprivation floating it's the same thing. It's like, where is this light coming from? Especially in a sealed container with not one photon. It's like the light must be generated from my own body. So I think that has profound implications. I've been messing around with neurofeedback for the last few years. And I'm wondering if this might be a form of that, being able to see light like that emitting from your body might be a form of neurofeedback and a form of kind of self-therapy. But that's just a theory. I don't know how it works truly. There were a lot of Q&A questions that I didn't have time to ask Matt. Uh, some of them I'm confident that I could answer. Like, does he recommend blue blocking glasses outside? That would be a definite no. He recommends no glasses, no contacts, and you don't stare at the sun in the midday. It would be more a sunrise and a sunset thing, which I think is a great free therapy for the brain, especially if someone's dealing with anxiety or depression. I think if you get some nutrition coming in, some vitamin E, some K2, 
some magnesium, maybe some shilajit. Then you add that in, and that's kind of like the stimulus to light up the whole brain and allow it to rebalance itself. We had some funny questions come in, like, why is Matt always sunburned? Is he overdoing the sun exposure? And I think he is one of the few people in the world that really gets how beneficial the light is. And I would guess that if there is any detriment to it, he thinks that the benefits outweigh the detriment. And I loved how he said that each color has a different effect, like even green light, which isn't talked about. And the colors coming direct from the sun is true nutrition. Obviously, I talk a lot about lipofuscin and age spots and age pigment. And I can't see that on Matt yet. He is a young guy. And it sounds like he does believe that DHA is still foundational for health. So it'll be interesting to see uh, in the next 10 or 20 years um, how his, his skin looks. And I don't mean that in a mean way at all. I think we're each an experiment and it's helpful to look at people and especially look at the skin. Uh, oftentimes we look for six pack abs and we look for muscles and I don't think that's the thing to look for. I think looking at the complexion and the quality of the skin is more important. And when you look at someone like Ray Pete, which is almost 90 years old and he has flawless skin, you have to think, wow, he must know something about health. If he doesn't have one age spot on his forehead and every single person I've seen over the age of 80, especially just has these spots freckled all over their forehead. And from my research, that's called lipofuscin and credit to Adam Bergstrom. He's written over 10 books on yellow fat disease and what causes it. And it's really polyunsaturated fats. Specifically, the hufas, the highly unsaturated fatty acids, the omega-3s more than the omega-6s contribute to this condition. And iron makes it worse. Aluminum makes it worse. Excess estrogen makes it worse. And it's like this polymer melted plastic that accumulates in the lysosome, specifically the cell, and will inhibit autophagy or cellular recycling or taking out the trash. And I'm really passionate about this subject, especially in the context or in light of this conversation about sunlight, because we definitely need sunlight exposure, even at partial times of the year. I think we're designed to get less of it in the winter, and especially in northern and southern latitudes. But I think we can mitigate a lot of the damage caused by ultraviolet light. Like Matt talks a lot about avoiding toxic sunscreens. And that was one of the first things I learned that people are rubbing aluminum laden sunscreen on their skin and then going out in the sun with all of these chemicals and probably plastics as well. And that's what's partially creating the sunburn and contributing to melanomas and skin cancers. And then my next leap in understanding of protecting my skin from the sun was to utilize green vegetable juicing. And I remember camping and I brought my Breville juicer and I brought a whole bunch of celery, carrots, and cucumbers. And that was kind of my base for my juices for several years, three or four years when I was heavily juicing. Organic, of course, the best quality I could find from the co-op versus, you know, a big health food store. And I did notice that I didn't get burned as much if I drank that juice before I went out in the sun. And I credit beta carotene, which is a carotenoid found in carrots, which if you drink too much carrot juice, you know, you turn orange but I don't think that's a safe way to do it, just like I don't think supplementing astaxanthin is a safe way to do it, which I used to sell and promote, which is another carotenoid that is marketed along with spirulina as a healthy algae to supplement orally. And it's marketed as an endurance booster and pr protecting the skin from 
ultraviolet light damage. But I think there's collateral damage that's caused uh, with carotenoids because they accumulate in the tissues and they can inhibit thyroid function especially. I think the safer way to protect yourself from the sun is to utilize vitamin E, not just externally, but even more so internally. And I've done experiments with sunbathing, taking large amounts of vitamin E and noticing that I don't burn as much. It's really the polyunsaturated fats with their multiple double bonds that are more prone to oxidation. If your skin is full of those, then it's my current belief that those oxidize and causes free radical damage and causes ultraviolet light photo damage. So I just love this topic of sunlight and light in general. I think it's very nuanced. Uh, There's a lot of context going on with the food that you grew up in, the saturation of the oils and the fats that you consumed. That all determines how you react to sunlight. And I think for someone that's very compromised, then red light therapy or using a device indoors can really be a lifesaver. There are certain diseases and conditions where the sunlight is just too strong. And I think that's where targeted light therapy has its benefits. I would just be wary of overpaying for a light therapy device. Uh, I really like the company Gemba Red by my friend Andrew Latour. I think he puts out a lot of great blog posts Uh, scientifically backed he has great youtube videos where he's using meters to measure the output not solar meters which is what a lot of red light companies do and there's also the view that you can just get a 250 watt heat lamp Um, us being fully off grid that's just simply not an option because that's a huge amount of energy to use that's more of like an on-grid solution And there's one kind of benefit to that. You're more getting heat and a specific infrared range. I think it's near and mid. You're not getting too much far. And so I like them all. You know, try them all. Try far infrared, dry sauna. Try the chicken bulbs, the 250 watt lamps. And try the red light therapy devices. The LED types that use usually near infrared and visible red frequencies and i think it's foundational a lot of people look at red light therapy and using these light devices it's just like biohacking and extra but being here in idaho where we don't get a lot of sunlight for half the year or light at all our hormones are controlled by light so it's not something that you can just cut out and continue along your merry way it's something that you have to figure out And how much you spend is up to you. I think there are a lot of cheap devices out there and people will try to save money and just purchase things off Amazon. But I would recommend looking for people that have done the research like Gemba Red and come out with high integrity products that do what they say they do and and have the output that they claim. Chroma is another one that I have on my website, Get Chroma. And I'm using my Sky Portal right now, and I utilize it mostly in the winter. It's blue and infrared light that really wakes up my brain and gives my brain the signal that it's time to go and not to produce melatonin. So I'll put the links below for where you can follow Matt. He's on Instagram under the light diet. Whether you're new to this research on light or seasoned and advanced, Either way, I think he has valuable information that you'll find interesting. And his website to purchase the glasses can be found at rawoptics.com. And if you use my discount code BLACKBURN, you'll save a little bit. I think it's really cool that he uses synthetic melanin in the lenses. And his glasses are tough. I've had pairs of his for years and dropped them. And they could take a beating and they look just like when I got them. And my website is matt-blackburn.com. I have my CLF protocol up there. I have blog posts on shilajit, vitamin E, endotoxin, magnesium. 
And I have all my recommended products up there, including AirTube headphones, which people often overlook wearing the over-the-ear headphones. It's really good if you can use AirTube because it's not sending that EMF directly to your brain. There's a break there. And so you're really protecting your brain from being fried. And it's really length of exposure. So if you do a lot of long phone calls, then you definitely want to look at mitigation strategies. And I think EMF blocking clothing is one of those if you commute a lot in your car, if you don't want to look silver when you go to your work, um, you can just throw it on when you drive to and from. But I know a lot of people that live in cities do really long commutes, um, maybe three hours round trip, maybe six hours round trip. And that's where the damage really occurs because you're ungrounded. You know, there's rubber tires. You're not touching the earth and you have Bluetooth going on and you have smart cars and you have smart cars driving by you and you're driving by cell towers on the freeway and your whole system's really getting hit hard. And so I think wearing silver embedded clothing like no choice makes a lot of sense they make jackets and joggers and you could really go crazy they have gloves and socks with different companies and beanies and hats and i think if anything just protecting your cranium protecting your head from emfs is really important whether that's a baseball cap or a baklava like he sells which is good for airports so that the face covering actually has a purpose and is doing something. I think people really underestimate travel and the ravages that that causes on the body. So we have the mitigation tools available. I really recommend Blue Shield, Portable, and Blue Blocking Glasses, and really stacking everything that you can to not harm your health when you're commuting. And my brand is called MitoLife, you can find that at mitolife.co, M-I-T-O-L-I-F-E. And I have a bunch of cool products, and we're always thinking of more. We're still working on our undercounter drinking water filtration system that we're really excited about. There's nothing like it on the market, and it's going to be effective and affordable. The ETA on that is by the end of 2021. It's one of those things since we're building it from scratch, it's going to take a while to develop it. But we do have awesome products in stock like Pure She Legit tablets, which, by the way, we just posted an updated lab results of heavy metals in our tablets. And a lot of people aren't aware that natural She Legit resin contains metals. But it's important to understand that they're all bound to fulvic acid. And Shilajit is basically like the whole periodic table. You're getting 84 plus carbon bonded, organic, usable minerals. And because there's fulvic acid in there, and they're in the proper form and ratio, ratios, the body will take what it needs and excrete the rest. So it's much, much safer than taking a multi-mineral supplement, which you don't know if you're high in one mineral or low in another. You're just throwing the whole kitchen sink at your body, which is the element game, which is really dangerous. But Shilajit is a whole food, complete trace mineral source. So you don't have to worry about all the trace minerals that people are trying to get from green powders and green juices, which is not the way to do it because you'll be getting excess calcium and iron. If those were grown in salt-based NPK fertilizer, under acid rain, with tap water, with bio sludge. So the winning combo is really to find a local farm, eat pastured eggs, high quality milk, either cow or goat or whatever you can digest, and grass fed beef or elk or bison or deer or moose. And that animal nutrition, the B vitamins, the amino acids, the copper, all of that really helps to strengthen the system. And then you just add Shilajit on top of that. And you could see 
massive results or massive turnarounds very quickly. So back to the lab results, really excited about this because it came back really low. We tested for arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead. And the arsenic, cadmium, and mercury were basically non-detectable, less than 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. And the lead was 0.13, which is really, really low. I have another company's Shilajit tablets lab report pulled up here, and the lead was 0.90. So it's actually a seven times increase. And the arsenic was 1.3. That's actually 26 times the amount of arsenic that's in Mitolife Panacea tablets. So just be careful when you're online looking for bargains. You really get what you pay for with nutritional supplements. And these heavy metals accumulate in the body. And so if someone's not doing regular sweating in a sauna, or if their elimination channels are blocked, then over time, these can cause issues. In general, Shilajit is very safe. Shilajit itself is a heavy metal chelator. That's actually what it does to excess iron in the body, which is its number one most important function to me is that it chelates excess iron from the body, which is a metal. If someone doesn't understand how harmful NPK fertilizer is and how it knocks out the nitrogen cycle in the soil and what that does to the plants being able to uptake fulvic and humic acids, if they don't get that little piece that's a really critical piece to miss. And then they'll look at Sheila G as just a biohacking thing or just another supplement and not looking at it as a foundational thing. Because I'm into anti-aging or some people call it pro youth thing. One of my favorite quotes I've ever read about Sheila Jeet is in the context of extending human lifespan radically. The Karaka Samhita states that use of Shilaji enables the user to witness a hundred summers on earth free from disease and decay. Each 7.75 pounds or three and a half kilos of Shilaji taken successfully adds a century to the duration of the human life. While 77 and a half pounds or 35 kilos extends it to a thousand years. Additional quantities are said to extend lifespan in increments of a century up to 1,000 years. Now that's a very questionable, controversial quote, but it makes sense if lipofuscin is the terminal toxin and if lipofuscin is the marker of biological aging and iron is contributing to that, then this would make sense since Shilajit is an iron chelator. And not only that, but it's contributing copper as active copper, because remember, they're all in Shilajit in the perfect form and the perfect ratios that nature designed. It contains ceruloplasmin, which allows us to utilize oxygen properly. So you're not only taking away the thing that's causing rust, but you're enhancing the body's ability to utilize oxygen and further yet you're supplying tons of trace minerals that aren't in our food anymore and that perhaps we never get in our food supply every mineral activates enzymes and if enzymes can't work then we shut down electrical highways throughout our body and that will cause organ systems glands and tissues to fail so maybe i'll have a future episode on sheila jeet i'm going to end the rant there but it's a foundational thing and i think that it just synergizes with everything else so there's a new episode released every friday please share my life radio with your friends leave a review if you enjoy the content and it's been useful for you and i will see you guys next week stay supercharged mm-hmm.